Good morning. Can I welcome you to our service this morning as we gather together in worship. Um, thank you for joining with us in person and also joining with us online. Just a few things to highlight on the announcement sheet. If you read through those, you'll discover uh, different things there. Uh, next Sunday, I'm going to be leading a service here and then Kirk Session. We have our meeting uh, tomorrow night at 7.30 in the Macmillan Room. Also then, you will see that the UCB Bible reading notes for Mar May, July are available uh, for collection and then also information about coffee and chat on Wednesdays uh, in 3.09 at 2.30. Again, I encourage you to stay for tea and coffee uh, after the service to chat and to meet up with others. It's really good to be back after uh, a week of a break and uh, I was in the north coast last week and obviously was able to go out and walk and do all sorts of different things and one of the days um, Dylan and I uh, went photographing and um, came across do you, hopefully, hopefully you can see that can you can you see that okay or at least some kind of idea where it might be uh, I'll give you a clue it's Rathlin is in the background uh, and it's a place that I've kind of, I, I don't think I've ever been there before. I'm, I'm not sure that I have. It's a place called Kinbain Castle. And uh, I see some of you nodding your heads. You must have been there before. But I never took the photograph. It was after I came away from the place and was looking, looking back over this photograph. And a few things really struck me about it. One was the frailty of mankind. You see the two wee individuals standing at the top of the cliff face. And my thought was, what is man that you're mindful of him? From Psalm 8. Just the frailty of mankind and, and how small we are in the context of, of all of this. But then also I thought about the changing circumstances of life. You see the castle there and how life has changed and continues to change each day of our lives. It doesn't stay the same. The changing circumstances of life, also illustrating the fast movement of time. How time moves on so quickly from one moment people living in the castle and in that context there, and you have Dunluce Castle up the north coast as well. But also you'll see, well, I don't know whether you can see him or not, but you see the path. You'll see a little figure there, which is actually Dylan. You see the two people up on the cliff illustrating friendship, family and friendship, the important things of life. But also... One of the things that strikes me about this is our awesome God, the one who is creator, the one who has created us and created this, who does not change. While everything else changes and we see the frailty of mankind, we see a God who is awesome and a God who loves us. And hence, the heading for that picture, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. This is the one that we come to worship this morning. It's before him that we buy, the one that we can trust and we can look to in faith. We're going to join together in singing our first hymn, O oh, Church, Arise. Let's stand and sing praise to God.
it's a great song to be singing, reminding us of, of who Jesus is and how or what he has done. I'm going to turn to God's Word. I've been thinking about what we're going to do over the next few weeks, um, maybe up towards the summer to the end of June. And I'm kind of thinking along the lines of David uh, in the Old Testament and David's relationships, the various relationships that he had with different people, whether it was Saul or whether it was Jonathan or Bathsheba or whatever, just to look at some of those and see how uh, God speaks to us through that, how he leads us back to himself. And this morning, I'm going to look at David's relationship with God. Well, actually, it's, it's the first, and there's a second one coming later on the series of his relationship with God and how he praises him. But today, it's going to be focusing on, on his calling uh, to be king, and maybe a wee bit about Samuel in there as well. So, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 14. It says in the New International Version, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be in your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint uh, for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and they had him brought in. <clears throat> he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, this, from that day on the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. This is God's word for us this morning. I'm going to sing together again. Um, when the music fades and all is stripped away, I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Let's stand and sing praise to our God.
We have the opportunity to come into God's presence in prayer. And those steps up uh, to the top of Cave Hill remind me of how we are able to have access, that we can walk into the presence and our prayers go into the presence of God simply because of Jesus Christ, because we stand complete in Him today. So let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. I want to use some of the thoughts that we've had in our reading in, in 1 Samuel. Oh God, we thank you that we can come into your presence today. In truth, none of us of ourselves can enter into your presence. It, we only come through Jesus Christ. But God, you know us. You know every detail of our lives. You set the times and the places that we live. You know every word that comes out of our mouths, even before we speak. We are comforted by the fact that your hand is always on us and surrounding us. There is nowhere that we can go to be out of your presence, nor is there anywhere that we can hide that you do not see us and know about us. You have identified with us in our humanity when you dwelt amongst us in Jesus Christ. You've provided an example for us of how we are to live through faith in him. But today we ask that you would search each of us to see if there is anything in us which is offensive to you and that you might then lead us in your way, which is eternal. We confess our sin to you. Too often we walk around with a sense or without a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving, not realizing or acknowledging that everything that we have has come from you. Forgive us whenever we judge people on outward appearances, how they look and how they act. Forgive us too when we don't stretch out the hand of kindness to all or are ungracious or unkind to those who are different and who don't see things the way we do and who have had a different experience from us. Forgive us whenever we are insular and oblivious to the needs of others. Our God, we know that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ who forgives sin, who is able to make us right with you, who is able to refresh us, renew us, and restore us. Help us today to embrace him with our whole hearts. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together again. Lord, I come to you.
Let's pray together. Father, we just still our hearts before you this morning and ask that you would hold us close, that you would refresh us and restore us, encourage us and build us up, walk with us. We ask that we might know a sense of your presence as we look to your word because we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we come to God's Word uh, in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 14, we're celebrating at the moment 25 years since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And yet, it maybe appears that we're kind of stuck a bit in the moment, unable to move forward. Negative voices create stumbling blocks And yet the constant cry of, we don't want to go back to what we experienced, what we were experiencing in our most difficult of days. But we cannot get distracted or discouraged. We must continue to move forward into positive communal relationships where we see dignity and value in all people in our land. We can't get stuck. We can't be allowed to be held back. Saul has been king and reigning over God's people. He's been appointed and anointed in response to the people's request for a king. And Samuel has been instrumental in this happening, having sought God and then having anointed him as ruler. Now we're at the point in this section where God has rejected Saul. Saul had started out with so much promise, but now his greatest desire seems to be his longing to be honored because that's what he brings up before before Samuel. Yeah, I might be rejected, but make sure I'm honored. It's in chapter 15 and verse 13 that despite his rejecting, rejection by God, he is still looking to be honored by people. And this is despite disobeying God's word and spending time building a monument to himself rather than worshiping the Lord and leading God's people. And so in 1 Samuel 16, God has a question for his prophet, Samuel. And the question is this. In the ESV, it says, how long are you going to grieve in this situation? In the NIV, how long are you going to mourn in this situation? Eugene Peterson, how long are you going to mope around? God is making clear to Samuel that his plans are not going to fail because of the failures of Saul. And his moping around is not going to change anything for the people of God or for himself. His challenge to Samuel, to his prophet, is this. Samuel, you need to move on. You need to deal with this and move on to what I'm calling you to do. God says, I'm still in control. I have work for you to do, and I want you to be part of that. You can't be paralyzed by what has happened to Saul. What was it that was causing him to, as Eugene Peterson says, mope around? Well, was it a sense of failure? Well, he was the one that had anointed him. He's the one that had prayed and had been felt led to this decision? Or was it a a lack of fulfillment in his own ministry? Feeling, well, this is not really working. Or was it a sense of personal loss? That he was the one that was affected by all this? It was his problem. Or was it his embarrassment? 
that this kingship didn't work out, having been heavily involved in the whole process. I think Samuel was upset and discouraged over the spiritual disaster that had happened. Saul was a promising servant of the Lord who got distracted and became disobedient. He was upset that this man was not leading the people of God in the way that he was supposed to be, and that their security was now actually at risk. And I think that's commendable. I think that's good. The sense that he had of being upset that Saul had not led people in the way that God had wanted him to, that there was a spiritual crisis going on, and he noticed and he's discouraged. But at this point, he can't allow that to paralyze him to do nothing. At that point, he's got to look to God, to listen, to trust, and to follow God's leading. He needed to get back to God's plan, to see the plan working through. I found it interesting over the last couple of days uh, watching a program called um, Welcome to Wrexham. Does anybody know anything about Wrexham at the moment? Anyway, you may have seen a thing in the news, Wrexham football, football team. Um, I remember them in the old, what was the old first division and players like Mickey Thomas and all the rest of it. And, and they were a good team at that time. But then a series of events happened in, in their, their history, and they were relegated through various leagues and eventually end up outside of the football league, which is pretty catastrophic, going from Division One out of the football league, uh, to the extent that they were going through financial difficulties, and, and then um, the fans loved the place so much that they got together and they provided money to keep the club going. But then in recent days, in the last, I think, three years, um, you know Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds, the two Hollywood A-list stars, have bought the football club. And they then have set a plan in motion to get the football club back to into the football league and, and up the leagues and all the rest of it. So they had a plan. I, I was watching some of that whole, that is now documented in, in one of those uh, series on one of the, 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 the channels. Fascinating to see them coming together, trying to work through the plan, moving forward out of a situation of despair out of a situation where things were not good. And actually, la just last night, Wrexham beat Boreham Wood to win the National League, which means that they have gone up into the Football League just last night. I was really struck by that in the fact that I suppose I could see parallels. They didn't, they, the, the fans didn't sit around and, and wait and despair. And these two people coming in with a plan where the fans have got behind them and they're working to the plan and eventually their conviction and commitment has paid off. God is saying to Samuel in the midst of this difficult situation, I have a plan and I want you to partner with me in that. God's challenging his prophet to step out of the situation and the, the mindset that he's in to move forward and follow God's plan. What an encouragement, what a challenge for us today. Sometimes it is easy to get discouraged in our faith. As we see people rejecting faith, rejecting God, and not really that interested anymore. We see falling numbers in churches. 
And yet God still has a plan and a purpose. His gospel, his good news is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is still the same, the same message. And he's calling us to be part of that. Part of that plan to see his kingdom established. So God says that to Samuel then, now, I want you to go and find and anoint a new king. God promises his guidance that he will lead him to the right person because God really is the king in his kingdom. He never loses control, nor is he like Saul. Samuel is concerned that Saul will hear of what he is doing and kill him. He's told to go to Bethlehem and sacrifice to the Lord to get the people to consecrate themselves because of the nature of what he's about to do. It's interesting here that Samuel doesn't give the whole truth in order to protect himself and the prospective king and the people around him. At the time, Jesse's sons are all brought out before him. And Samuel is impressed with Eliab, who's the first one. And he's ready to appoint him. Just in the same way that he felt about Saul in chapter 9 and verse 2. Oh, this man, this, he looks really good. He's got all the attributes that I think he needs. Oh, he's the one. Just look at him. And just in the same way that God spoke to Samuel in the temple. Do you remember Samuel? Four times he called him. Just in the same way that God spoke to Samuel then, he speaks to him here now. Samuel, don't look at his height or his appearance. Don't go on first impressions or the way he looks. Man looks in the outward appearance or the words are, man looks in the face. But the Lord looks on the heart. I think character is being emphasized over reputation. What people are is more important than what they do. What we can see doesn't always give us a true picture of a person. Last Sunday, whenever I was in church, uh, the, the guy who was leading the service uh, used an illustration, and I, and I want to use it because I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I'm sure you've come across this book. You maybe read it, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Mackesy. And uh, there's a, the, the, this page here, um, which there, there's a little uh, question. I was talking to the boys and girls in Cape Hill Primary School this week about this. Uh, looking, you know, sometimes people ask you what you want to be when you grow up, etc. Well, well, uh, the boy, uh, the mole asks. Um, sorry, where are we at here? Um, what you see, the little boy sitting in the the branch of the tree, and he says, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" Kind, said the boy. And I thought, wow, that is incredible. You know, you think of all the things that maybe young people, we all w want to be whenever we grow up. And, and yet, here's something that's emphasizing character. I looked up kindness. Kind means to be friendly, generous, and considerate. God looks at people differently than we do. We often only look at the outside. We make judgments based on what we see. And God sees what's in the heart, the inner thoughts, the motivations. He knows our thoughts, our reasoning, our desires, and our emotions. And he's able to search us totally with nothing hidden. What we see tells us nothing of what's in a person's heart, their motivation or their commitment. Very often, we only see what people want us to see. We're not good at knowing people, and, and especially ourselves. We're reminded that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who could know it? As God speaks these words to Samuel, I think there's a reason why he's saying them. 
And we often quote those words, I suppose, sometimes even out of context. But the reason why God is saying those words to Samuel is to say to Samuel, Samuel, you're not making this choice. I am. I am the one who will choose the king because I am the king. The reality is that Samuel cannot be trusted to make this kingdom appointment because of the way he sees things and not like God. Isn't that a tremendous principle for us as we go about the work of God here? As we seek to follow his will in our lives, that he's the one who makes the choices not us. Because our choices and our knowledge is limited. We need to seek God and his leading in all areas of our lives. Because in truth, like, like Samuel, we can't be trusted. Because our, our judgments are limited. And so that's why we set the priority in speaking and seeking him and the filling of his Holy Spirit. But as it concludes, Samuel says, or Samuel says to, to Jesse, is, is that all your sons? And the truth was that Jesse saw no need to invite his youngest to this sacrifice. He can stay with the sheep. And you wonder why. Did he not think he was important enough to be part of this conversation, this choice. But eventually, Samuel said, look, go and get him. We'll not do anything until you get him and, and we see him. So he sent for this ruddy and handsome young guy with beautiful eyes who appears before them. And also later on in chapter 16, one of the young people says this about Samuel, or about David that this son of Jesse was skillful in playing music. He was a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and that the Lord is with him. Gosh, that's some recommendation. But we're also told in chapter 13 and verse 14 that the Lord was seeking a man after his own heart. And he chooses David. And so Samuel is told, right, up you get and anoint him. He's the one. Probably the most unlikely candidate. But what we see here is that God is not bound by human standards of valuing people. God's choices sometimes surprise us. And yet he is glorified whenever we embrace that choice that has surprised us. While Samuel and Jesse and the others had ideas of who they thought should be king, God had chosen David. They thought some of the others were going to be the savior of Israel. But God said David was going to be the Savior. And that's the truth that sometimes God saves us from our own saviors. Those things and those people that we think are the solution to the problems that we face. Sometimes we appoint ourselves as the Savior because we think we can sort things out. We can deal with these issues. Maybe it comes to our own salvation and we appoint ourselves as our own Savior. Or sometimes we appoint others as our Savior. Maybe our spouse. Maybe our family members. Maybe our friends or work colleagues. Or maybe even at some, something else like our career, our sports, or our entertainment. And we look to them to be our saviors. And the truth is that they don't save us. They are never the Savior that we thought they were. There is only one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
In this context, it was David whom God had appointed. In our context, it's Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that God allowed to go through the cross and the resurrection in order that we, we might have life through faith, that he might give us that life. For so all things became very different whenever David is chosen. The Spirit of the Lord departs from Saul, and a harmful spirit came and tormented him. The words there are actually ter terrified or terrorized him. Wayne Grudem makes the point that Saul will make many futile attempts to govern without the Spirit. That was the consequence of turning away from God and rejecting him. The Spirit of God left him in leadership. But whenever David is chosen, the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him from that day forward. He is chosen and he is equipped for kingship. This will be for many encounters that we will discover with many people and many situations of challenge and even conflict. And yet the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Yes, there are times whenever he obviously struggles and he disobeys God and he turns away from God. He's human like the rest of us. But we're told the Spirit of God came upon him. And that's what happens as he's anointed by God for this task. In the same way that whenever we come to faith in Christ, we are given his Holy Spirit to help us as our comforter, our encourager, and the one who walks along with us. The presence of Jesus in our lives to enable us to follow him. Jesus himself experienced the same thing whenever the Spirit came upon him at his baptism, and then he experienced the work of the devil straight afterwards in the temptations. Yet, he was victorious. He was faithful, even to the point of death. And then God raised him, as we were singing earlier. Samuel needed to look to and to trust God again, to move away from his circumstances and what he was thinking and feeling at the time. He needed to hear God's voice directing him to appoint a new leader. He needed to realize that he himself depended on God and that God was king in his kingdom and not him. And in that way, God was able to be glorified. What an encouragement for us today as we think about this message of God, of David's relationship with God and how God chose him, how he used Samuel, how he used the whole circumstance to bring David to that place where he wanted him. Isn't that God, what God does with all of us? He's able to use all of our circumstances to bring us to the place that he wants us so that he can use us in the work of his kingdom in the way that he's called us. So we might be able to bring glory and honor to him. Let's allow him to work with us, that he calls us to follow him and be his disciples in Christ. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement you give to us. So help us that we might be able to focus our lives on what your plan is for us. Help us not to be getting discouraged by our circumstances or Father, help us to look to you in faith, to realize that you're the one who is able to bring us through, that you're the, able, the one who is able to help us to walk with you by the power of your Holy Spirit in faith. Help us to keep in step with your Spirit. So hear our prayers because we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to sing together. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty.
say thank you for joining with us this morning in worship, uh, both here in person and also online. Thank you to Alison and Andrew for choosing and playing those hymns this morning. Thank you so much. And also to Barton and Connor for recording the service, Trevor, who uploaded it to uh, YouTube later on so that uh, people can, can watch it afterwards. Thank you to Leslie and to Ruth for providing coffee and tea for us this morning. Please do take the opportunity to, to uh, avail of that. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your presence with us this morning. And now as we've gathered for worship, we would ask that you would scatter us for witness. We ask that you would part us with your blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.